So good afternoon, class. Um, for today's lesson, we're going to talk about the higher functions of the nervous system. Okay. So I think this is the last lecture for your module on the nervous system. So at the end of this session, you guys should be able to first distinguish the function with functions of the different lobes of the cerebral cortex. Second, to learn an overview of the electroencephalogram. So if the heart has the electrocardiogram, the brain also has an electroencephalogram. And then third, we're going to try to understand the sleep-wake cycle, learn how cerebral dominance and language works, and to comprehend the concept of learning and memory. Okay? So this is an illustration of the cerebral cortex. Um, I think you're all familiar with this with your neuroanatomy, if I'm not mistaken. So this is the um, lateral view of your cerebral cortex. Of course, you have your um, frontal cortex, your parietal cortex, your temporal lobe, as well as your occipital lobe. And this one is um, looking from the medial aspect of the cerebral cortex. Again, you have the corresponding occipital lobe. Your frontal lobe in yellow, your front, I sorry, your parietal lobe in yellow, your frontal lobe in yellow green, and the one in purple would be your temporal lobe. And this one in the center will be your corpus callosum. So the corpus callosum is a band of nerve tissue that connects the two lobes, your right, uh, your right and your left, uh, sorry, connects your two hemispheres, your right and your left hemispheres and coordinates the activities between the two hemispheres of the cerebral cortex. So if your corpus callosum is transected, you lose the coordination um, between the two um, cerebral hemispheres. Okay. So your central sul sulcus divides your parietal cortex from your from your frontal cortex. And then your lateral sulcus um, separates your temporal lobe and your frontal lobe. And then the parieto occipital fissure from the, name, from the name itself separates your parietal lobe and your occipital lobe. And again, this is your corpus callosum. So let's go first to your frontal lobe. Your frontal lobe is mainly responsible for two things. One is your motor behavior. So it's that part of the brain that dictates um, your movement. And your language is also formed in your frontal lobe. So for your motor behavior, you have your premotor cortex involved in planning of movement. So for example, when you are going down the stairs, before you go down the stairs, you don't sense it, but um, your, your brain actually plans for you to move your leg down and then the next leg will go down and then the next leg will go down. Of course, you don't know it. It's kind of an automatic thing for us, but it's actually the premotor cortex that plans your movement one after the other. And the, uh, the motor cortex now will execute the movement that has been planned in your premotor cortex. Your brocus area is where your speech is generated no? or I try to remember this as boca, boca or vocal, you know, where you generate your speech, vocal. The prefrontal cortex also has a major role in personality and emotional behavior. So patients who have lesions in the prefrontal cortex can have attention deficit. They can have difficulty in planning and problem solving because remember the planning of movement is in your premotor cortex. Some patients would also show inappropriate social behavior and some would have um, reduced aggressive behavior. So I'll show you a picture. In the 1940s, they used to do a procedure called a frontal lobotomy in patients who have chronic schizophrenia. Some patients with chronic schizophrenia would have some very aggressive behavior. So what they did, knowing that um, the 
the frontal lobe is involved in behavior, they try to do lobotomy or removal of your prefrontal cortex. And here you will see what happens if you remove your prefrontal cortex. Okay? Can you hear? Let me know if you can see it. So this is a case of a 22-year-old male that has been ill for five years. They used to do electro, uh, electroconvulsive therapy or shock therapy in the 1940s. During this time, this patient developed aggressive behavior. So this was him before the frontal, prefrontal lobotomy. Okay. He would also have some difficulty planning his movement. Okay, and so they hypothesized this, that this patient would have um, would have um, lesions in their uh, or hyperactivity in their prefrontal cortex. Okay, so after the procedure, after they did the frontal lobotomy, they noted that the patient became more cooperative less aggressive behavior, okay? You see the patient? That's the scar from the frontal lobotomy, okay? Let's fast forward. And now the patient can now take care of himself, put on his clothes. Uh, two months post-op, Patient became more friendly, capable of making adjustment outside the hospital. He can now play with another person. Okay. Okay. So you see a little bit of improvement, no? All right. So let's move on. But of course, nowadays, they consider frontal lobotomy a very mutilating procedure because Patients who undergo frontal lobotomy would have very, very, very poor quality of life. Remember that it's not only behavior that is controlled by your frontal lobe, also has other functions that may be compromised with this procedure, right? Nowadays, there are, there are many, many, many very good drugs, no? Psych psychotropic drugs that can deal with patients with chronic schizophrenia and other mental health problems. So the this procedure has been um, debunked already. They don't do this procedure anymore, okay? So because through the years, uh, doctors and scientists were able to gain more insights on how the brain works, so they are able to treat mental health conditions with just using drugs. Next, we go to your parietal lobe. Your parietal lobe is the part of the cerebral cortex that is responsible for your somatosensory cortex or how your body, somato, senses things. No? And also, their parietal lobe is also your association cortex. It processes perception of sensory information. So for example, you touch, um, you touch a soft object. So when you touch a soft object, your the your skin senses the, the object, but it's actually your parietal lobe that is able to tell that this object is soft, okay? So because it's that part of the brain that processes the sensation that you perceive from your um, sensory organs. And it is also important in determining spatial context. All right, so the occipital lobe, on the other hand, is involved in visual processing and perception. So remember, this is the one that processes the things that are perceived by your eye. It also affects your eye movement and assists in control of convergent eye movements, pupillary constriction, and accommodation. So everything about the eye is connected to your occipital lobe. And then... Last T is your temporal lobe. So your temporal lobe has many functions. No? First is your hearing. It processes um, and perceives information related to sounds. Everything that is transmitted to your um, cochlear nerve is perceived in your temporal lobe. So when you hear music, it's transmitted by your 
to the from the outer ear to the inner to the middle ear to the inner ear into your cochlear nerve but it's actually the temporal lobe that interprets the music that you hear from the outside no? aside from that your temporal lobe also processes vestibular information from your um vestibular organs also in your inner ear so everything related to balance higher order of visual processing like recognition of faces no limbic system we all know that the limbic system is involved in your emotional behavioral um emotional and behavioral aspects of your brain so they say that our perception of love when we love someone is actually not really perceived in your heart but it's actually perceived in your limbic system located in the medial aspect of the temporal lobe. And lastly, your hippocampal formation is also within the temporal lobe. So it's actually, let's find it here in the illustration. Is it here? It's in the, you can see it in the medial aspect. So it's not here in the picture. So the hippocampus is involved in learning and memory. So we'll, we will discuss later. Now, the, the electroencephalogram or the EEG is an important diagnostic tool in clinical neurology, especially in patients with epilepsy. So similarly, like just like you're in your ECG, they put electrodes in the brain and these electrodes are able to detect or pick up the electrical activity of the brain and you can record it and the neurologist can be, will be able to interpret the different waves that are produced by your brain. So we'll take a look at this different thing. So they attach an ECG electrode in your scalp and it perceives the alternating excitatory and inhibitory synaptic potentials in the pyramidal cells of your cerebral cortex. And it is amplified by the EEG machine. Okay? So this is an example of an EEG with a demonstrable... Um, polyspike and wave discharges seen in juvenile myoclonic epilepsy. So this one, this part of the waves is normal, but you will see that there is a, an abrupt spikes in the EEG, um, EEG, what you call that, um, reception. And this is the part where you have your myoclonic jerks. Okay, so that's abnormal. So there's, these are the different waves that you will be able to see in an EEG. If in the ECG, you have your PQRST wave. In the EEG, you have the beta wave, the alpha wave, the theta wave, and the delta wave. So the beta waves are the waves you see when the patient is awake and with mental activity with eyes open. So if an EEG is attached to me right now, or I hope you guys are awake. So if that EEG is attached, you will be able to see beta waves. Now, if you close your eyes, but you're still awake, you're, you can hear everything around you, then you will now have the alpha waves. When you go to sleep, your brain slows down. It, it will now exhibit what you call the theta waves. And when you're in very deep sleep, the brain slows down further and you this will be seen in the EEG as delta waves. And during this period, um, the slow waves predominate, your muscles relax, your heart rate and blood pressure also slows down because that's the time that your body is able to rest. Okay. Next, we talk about also the sleep-wake cycle. So the sleep-wake cycle is the... Um, what we call the circadian rhythm, no? periodicity. So circadian is a one-day cycle. You also have other um, rhythms in the body, such as your um, menstrual rhythm. Diba? It's a 28-day cycle rhythm. Uh, what else? Um, but the most popular one is your circadian rhythm, which is just about one day. So normally, it becomes entrained to the day-night cycle. So our body perceives that when it's daylight, it's daytime. When it's nighttime, it's nighttime. So it's ingrained in our body. Now, in patients 
this is I know this is ingrained in your suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus that receives input from the retina. So when some patients um enter the hospital, goes into the ICU. In the ICU, sometimes there are no windows. They don't know if it's daytime, it's nighttime. They're awake. They're always um hearing sounds from the machine, visits from the doctors, no? Their sleep-wake cycle becomes disrupted because they can no longer perceive night and day, no? And this creates chaos in the circadian rhythm of the patient and some patients actually develop ICU psychosis because of this. So it's very important to maintain your sleep-wake cycle, okay? So when you sleep, no, you undergo several stages. No? You have stage one to five. The stage one, you have only light sleep. There's all the muscle activity starts to slow down. Some patients might have occasional muscle twitching. And then most of your sleep is actually kept with, in stage two. 45 to 50% of the whole entire sleep cycle your breathing and heart rate also slows down. There's a slight decrease in body temperature. When you go into stage three, this is the stage where your deep sleep begins and the brain begins to generate the slow delta waves that I showed you earlier. And then the stage four, this one is the very deep sleep. You will have rhythmic breathing. You have limited muscle activity and the brain continue to produce delta waves. Now, when you go into the REM, the stage five or your REM sleep, this is the time where you will have um, rapid eye movement. That's why, it, that's why it's called the REM because of the rapid eye movement that can be observed in these patients. So if you observe another person sleeping throughout the night and you see their eyes flickering under their eyelids, this is the time when they are already in the REM stage of sleep. The, and like in the stage three and four, you will see the brain waves will start to speed up. And this is the time, if you have dreams, this is the time when dreaming occurs. And contrary to stage three and four, your, your heart rate increases and your breathing may be rapid and shallow. So in REM sleep, usually it occurs uh, every 90 minutes. So the whole entire night, you will have Stage one to five, and then again, stage one to five, no? So it occurs every 90 minutes. And usually this is the time when you have dreams. Um, they observe that in patients who are given benzodiazepine, such as your midazolam, diazepam, and also with age, it decreases the duration of REM sleep. That's why elderly patients sometimes complain that they only have very light sleep they easily wake up in the middle of the night and have difficulty going back to sleep. That's the problem when you grow old, you know, when it comes to your sleep. The quality of sleep is not as good as when you were younger. Next, we're going to discuss also cerebral dominance. You know? Cerebral dominance is um, related to the function of language. So your left hemisphere for most patients is actually the one that is dominant, okay? Dominant for language, math, logic, problem solving, asking questions about the world, making connections, about the world, making connection. Your right hemisphere, on the other hand, is usually dominant for spatial abilities, piecing together a puzzle, arranging blocks to match design, reading maps. So what I'm trying to say here is if you have... Um, the parietal lobe on the left hemisphere, the parietal lobe on the right hemisphere, they usually don't have the same function because the right and left hemisphere have their own um, functions that are dominant for that side of the brain. So again, your right hemisphere is, is dominant for facial recognition, interpreting gesture, visual imagery, and music. So that's why when patients develop stroke, for example, Let's say they develop a thrombosis of the right middle cerebral artery. So if the right side of the brain is affected, they might have difficulty in recognizing faces. They might have difficulty piecing together a puzzle because the right hemisphere is dominant for these abilities. Okay? 
But this does not mean that they control these completely because functions largely overlap and quickly process the corpus callosum. Okay? So in most patients, the left cerebral hemisphere is the dominant hemisphere for language, whether you're right-handed or you're left-handed. So some people say that if you're left-handed, left-handed people are usually creative for music, for the arts. Um, but this is not always the case. No, That's just uh, an approximation. Okay. Some, because there are also right-handed people that are also creative, musically inclined, artistic. Huh? So remember earlier when I told you that the um, frontal cortex is responsible for speech generation. So in the frontal lobe, you have your Broca's area where speech is produced. Remember, vo Broca, Boca, Vocal. Okay. The vernix area, which is located in your temporal lobe, is responsible for speech comprehension or how you understand spoken language. Okay? So, lesions in the left hemisphere, since the left hemisphere is dominant for language, they usually have, these people usually have aphasia because... Aphasia means they have an inability to speak or write. When you talk to them, you know, they cannot answer you back or write because of the defect in the language from your left hemisphere. Your wernix area, if you have a lesion here, you will have receptive aphasia. Remember that wernix is where you comprehend your speech. So you can... You can hear the speech, no? you can talk, but when other people talk to you, you do not, you cannot, you have difficulty understanding what you um, are hearing. So these patients have fluent aphasia, meaning they cannot understand, they have difficulty understanding spoken language, but they can talk, okay? They can talk. Broca's aphasia, these patients will have expressive aphasia, meaning they can understand you, but they have difficulty talking. No? They have difficulty in speech and in writing, of course, but they can understand you relatively well because the wernix area is still functioning. So it's sometimes confusing. Broca, broca, boca. If there's a lesion there, you cannot vocalize. But you can understand. In wernix air, it's the opposite. You can you can vocalize, but you cannot. Un you have difficulty understanding. Okay, this is an example um, of a patient with wernix aphasia. They have since wernix aphasia, you can you can talk, but you have difficulty understanding. So if the examiner tells the patient, "Tell me the names of each of these." So I will point to uh, I will point to a cigarette. So I will say this is a cigarette, but they cannot understand it. So when you when you point to a comb, they cannot understand, but they can like somehow say words. Fork, you you point to a fork, they will try to say words. Okay, but because they cannot understand you, so they just say a different word because they don't know what you're what you're trying to tell that patient okay they they in their head they're saying i want an apple but when they talk they say a different um word okay what's this this is an example of bocas aphasia <laughs> This is a Coast Guard story in the 1970s. The examiner asked the patient, were you in the Coast Guard? So the, the patient, she, since the patient has Broca's aphasia, he can understand the examiner, but he cannot vocalize his answer. So he would say, no, or yes, ship massa to two sets, Coast Guard years. So he has difficulty um, expressing what he wants to say, but he can understand the question. Oh, you were in the Coast Guard for 19 years. Oh, 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 boy, right, right, 
Okay, I hope you understand what I mean by by broke as aphasia. You can understand, but you cannot vocalize properly. <clears throat> Next, we go to learning and memory. Learning is a neural mechanism by which the individual changes the individual changes behavior as the result of experience. So, for example, um, when I go to a restaurant and I taste their good food, I know next time that since they have good food here, I learn from my experience that I should come back here because the food is good there. You learn that the food is good there. Memory, on the other hand, is a storage mechanism for what we learn. Okay, so that later on we can retrieve that memories at a later time. Okay, what are the mechanisms by which we are able to um, develop learning and memory? One is habituation. Learning not to respond to repetitions of an insignificant stimulus or to ability to ignore irrelevant repetitive stimuli. So habituation, you get the habit. You get, you get habituated to it. So it's an example. So for example, if you see this um, mouse initially is scared of the truck. But the truck is not doing anything to the mouse. Then the next time another truck comes in, he learns that these things, the trucks, are not would, is not supposed to hurt him. No? So he learns this. No? So these things are starting to grow on him. So the next time a truck comes in, he's no longer bothered by it because he knows that it won't hurt him. He becomes habituated. He became habituated to the stimuli of the truck. Okay. So, for example, when you are in the classroom, uh, at the beginning, you will hear the trucks or the buses outside the classroom. At first, it might bother you, but when you get used to the noise of the buses outside the classroom, it will not bother you anymore and you'll be able to concentrate more on the lecture during the class okay? because you become habituated to it. That's one aspect of learning. Another aspect of learning and memory is sensitization. <laughs> you develop increased responsiveness to innocuous. Innocuous means painful stimuli that follow the presentation of a strong or noxious stimulus. So an example, for example, this mouse probably a lab rat, no, is injected with cocaine, let's say, from the, from the cartoon. And then he doesn't feel anything. But when he becomes injected again, he, does, he feels a little bit more jumpy. And then on the third day, he gets injected again. He becomes a lot more jumpier. And finally, on day four, you will see a very, very hyper um, mouse or lab rat because of the um, repeated um, strong or noxious stimuli. And because the mouth, the lab rat became sensitized to it because of the um, repeat repetitive um, presentation of the stimuli. So this is another example. Let's play. Ah. There's no, wait, let me play the video. There is a video for this. Anyway, let me. Anyway, so let's move on. Associative conditioning, learning to respond to a pre previously insignificant event after it has been paired with a significant one. So this is actually very helpful for medical students. So for example, um, this one, when this person sees this cat, no, he feels like dancing every time he sees this person. So for example, um, you have a date no, with a special person in a, let's say, a restaurant. And every time you drop by that restaurant, you remember that person. Because 
um, it has been paired with a significant um, memory. So that's your associative condition. So sometimes I use this when I study. So for example, I'm trying to study um, the cranial nerves and I want to memorize it. I try to make a mnemonic and relate a mnemonic to something personal to me so that when I try to recall the cranial nerves, I will try to remember that thing that I attached to the cranial nerve so that I will be able to retrieve the memory of how I, I studied the cranial nerve. So that's actually a very good tool for you guys to use. Okay? So the memory is in... So if you decide that you have to remember something, for example, when studying for a test, the brain makes connection between the cells, which alters their structure and is what allows us to retain memories. So it's the alteration in the structure of the brain, the nerve um, connections no, that creates memories. Wait. So we have two types of memory. You have your long-term memory. And you have your um, short-term memory. Let me just have a minute. So in long-term memory, it's usually associated with events, facts, or experiences that were laid down weeks, months, or even years ago. Um, an example of this would be your birthday or your mom's birthday that happened many years ago, or let's say a memory from the time when you were still a kid, okay? Or a memory of like related to history, okay? It can be intermediate form. It can be disrupted, meaning you can still forget about it. Long-lasting form is something that is, which is difficult to disrupt or difficult to forget. So for example, you guys, do you think you'll able you will be able to forget your birthday? Probably not. Okay. So for me, an example would be our my phone number. No, my phone number when we I was a kid in our home. I don't think I'll be able to forget our phone number. No, because it has been me for many decades, and it will be very difficult for me to forget about it. Short term memory is um, usually related to recent events. An example would be. Let's say, what did I eat for lunch? So that's short-term memory. Persist, usually this memory persists for only a few minutes. So for example, you're talking to a telephone operator and a telephone operator is telling a phone number. You try to memorize it in your head. After a few minutes, you write it down in a piece of paper and then you forget about it, okay? An example of this would be when you memorize the Krebs cycle, after the exam, you completely forget about the Krebs cycle. Huh? That's your short-term memory. So long-term memory involves structural changes in the nervous system because this form of memory can remain intact even after the events that disrupt short-term memory. So it's difficult for you to forget. Okay? So if you remember the movie 50 First Dates where Drew Barrymore keeps forgetting her long-term memories, no, her short-term memories every time she wakes up in the morning. No? When she wakes up, she forgets about Adam Sandler. And then when she goes to sleep and wakes up, she forgets everything about Adam Sandler again. Okay? So... Um, I'm not saying that what happened to the 51st Dates um, character of Drew Barrymore is bilateral removal of the hippocampal formation. But when you have bilateral removal of the hippocampal formation, it severely and permanently disrupts recent memory. So you're not able to remember recent events or things. No, short Long-term memories, sorry, this is a typo. Long-term memories are unaffected, but new long-term memories can no longer be um, stored because of the removal of the hippocampal formation. Another aspect of learning and memory is neural plasticity. So if there is any damage to the nervous system, it can induce remodeling of neural pathways and thereby alter behavior. So an example would be neuros. Neural plasticity is greatest in the developing brain because the, the developing brain can 
is still very responsive to um, this process called neural remodeling. So this can be induced by lesions. No? An example would be, uh, just give me a minute. So an example would be um, this one, this baby, this kid has a lazy eye. So this, this kid has a lesion in one of his um, extraocular muscles. So what they usually do is to try to induce neural plasticity by patching the eye so that one of the extraocular muscles will try to relax to normalize this, um, this um, lazy eye. Okay, this is called sensory deprivation. So an example would be amblyopia or your lazy eye. Another example would be phantom limb. So in phantom limb, a person perceives sensations on the missing limb when stimulated elsewhere on the body. So for example, a patient undergoes knee amputation. Since there's still neural connection to that part of the limb, some patients still feel like it's still itchy or it's still painful when in fact the limb is no longer there. Okay, this is the result of um, result of the spread of connection from the surrounding cortical territories into the cortical region that had the amputated limb. So this is also another form of neural plasticity. So what happens during neural plasticity? There is synaptic pruning, just like trees. No, um, you can delete and create new connections. They are closely tied to the ability to learn and remember, and each neuron acts independently, but learning new skills require lots of neurons. Okay, so it's very important during the early years to try to develop neural connections because it's when the brain is still very receptive. Okay, so in summary, the cerebral cortex, we talked about the different lobes. Um, based on the pattern of the gyri and suci, and each lobe has distinctive functions as shown by the effects of lesions or seizures. So remember your frontal lobe, your parietal lobe, your temporal lobe, and your occipital lobe. Next, we talk about the EEG, which varies with the state of the sleep-wake cycle, disease, and other factors. So EEG rhythms include alpha waves when we are awake with eyes open, the beta waves, when we are awake but with closed eyes, theta waves, um, when you are um, asleep, delta waves when you are in deep sleep, okay? Sleep can be divided into slow wave and REM forms. So slow wave sleep progresses through stages one through four, each with a, each with a characteristic, characteristic EEG pattern, particularly delta waves in stage three and four, and most dreams occur in REM sleep. Next, we also talked about memory. Memory includes short term or something that you will retain in just a few minutes, recent memory, the past hours or days, and long term memories, no? the long term storage processes and a retrieval mechanism. But it's not memory if you cannot retrieve it. Okay. Damage to the nervous system can include the modeling of neural pathways and thereby alter behavior resulting in neural plasticity. So that's the end of my lecture. Okay, I will now stop recording. How do I stop recording?